The United States of America are not united in all aspects. While we have one president and one constitution, our 50 states retain distinct identities, and in many cases, distinct laws and regulations. The tension between a unitary national government and localized state laws has existed throughout our nation's history. And issues like gun control, abortion, and gay marriage ensure that tension will continue. But why? Why should each state enact and enforce its own laws? Aren't states more similar now than during the framing of our Constitution? We examine states' rights today on The Professors. From across the city and the seven city colleges of Chicago, broadcasting from 63rd and Halsted at Kennedy King College, professors take the art of conversation to a higher degree. I'm Ted Williams from Kennedy King College. Joining me today are professors Antonio Vasquez of Wright College, Pamela Canemaray from Kennedy King College, and Rashid Carter from Harold Washington College. Welcome. Now, before we start our conversation, let's take a look at a student-produced video on our topic for the day. Today, our nation is divided over states' rights. Many feel this growth of federal control and reduction of local control has gone too far. That the state of Arizona would want to rethink what policies it has uh, for immigration, uh, what policies it matches up with with the federal government, so that there is a lot more collaboration, not just with the United States federal government, but as well as Mexico. The Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. I don't know how to better characterize this gross misinterpretation of the Tenth Amendment. And I think a lot of times when those policymakers or those lobbyists go in to help influence that interpretation, that interpretation is always weighted on the, at the added benefit of some other larger interest. This amendment was the basis of the doctrine of states' rights that became the rallying cry of the southern states during the Civil War. During the 1960s, the forced integration of schools of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 created a confrontation between the power of the federal government and the rights of the states to make their own laws. I think the laws affects the different states in two ways. It will either show us an example of what to do or give us a great example on what not to do. If it's a mandatory federal health care program, then some states might oppose it because they don't see how their revenue uh, will or will not get used for their state. So if it's a national program and all states have to pony up the same amount of money, but your population is less in one state and more in another, then you're actually going to be, you know, someone in Washington state might be paying for health care for people in Texas. Resolving states' rights will be a hard-fought battle for years to come. Reporting for the professors on WYCC, this is Lillian Pagan. Okay, so we're talking about states' rights today. And uh, it's interesting because I'm relatively agnostic on this issue uh, in terms of really favoring federal or states' rights. Um, however, I remember thinking as we started this uh, program today that this would be a very sort of, um, you know, s uh, soft conversation. We kind of talk about theory, and then we, in our student-produced video, we see all these really controversial issues. Okay. And I'm saying, oh, we're going to have some fights <laughs> today. So, um, let's start with the. I think a good place to start is where the video uh, discussed about the history of states' rights and how that conversation has been used in issues of civil rights, particularly on uh, other issues as well. Rashid, do you want to talk about that? Well, yeah, you know, the, it, it seems like the, the history of states' rights, um, and, and it was mentioned in the, in the montage, this, this whole notion of the Tenth Amendment, mm -hmm. really emboldening states um, to uh, have, you know, rights that would dictate uh, decisions and, and policies that are in the best interest of the citizens of that particular state. Um, you know, if the, if the natural evolution of things, of course, also produced the 14th Amendment, which was meant to um, sort of uh, give uh, the, the federal government a greater um, expanse of power in terms of dictating um, outcomes 
programs that would uh, benefit the entire nation um, sure. as a collective. And so um, in, instead of just kind of looking at things in isolation, I think uh, we should think about things in terms of um, um, how collaboration can really put forth a, a, a dynamic within the nation that will look after the, the rights of citizens, um, not just in a particular state, but also within the framework of what is in the best interest of the United States. Okay. And I think that if you look at the evolution of these policies over time, um, this is exactly what's occurred. And uh, I think uh, an important watershed uh, moment was the, um, uh, outside of the 14th Amendment, was the uh, Lochner era of the, um, of the Supreme Court sure. uh, from 1897 to 1937. Uh, and what you saw there was um, the actual um, enforcement of that sort of uh, federal mandate sure. to provide uh, liberty and the sort of uh, rights that are um, you know, uh, common to all members of our nation outside of just Let states. me ask you guys a question. What, what do you think uh, as well about sort of how the evolution of uh, this issue has developed? Because one of the things that you see is this obviously was a rallying cry of the southern states during the Civil War and also during the Civil Rights Movement. But we've also seen a shift from a, um, uh, a much larger use of the federal government in recent years. So in 1913, federal expenditures represented 2.5% of our GNP. But today they represent close to 25%. Right. And so we see spending, which used to really be sort of at the state and local levels, has really grown to be much more of a federal issue. Uh, what do you think about why this development has occurred and what some of the political battles are that have, you know, developed in this way historically? Well, I'll give it a start. Sure. Um, from my point of view, a lot of it stems from the progressive era when you had the first Great Depression. We're in Depression 2.0 right now. Mm -hmm. And the adoption of a lot of the social programs now that are the big expenditures. Right. Like Social Security. Social Security, Medicare, uh, and Medicaid. The three yeah. big issues out there. As a matter of fact, uh, earlier this year, CNN uh, ran an article, which I reuse all the time in my economics courses, which talked about that by 2020, we will be using only eight cents to cover everything else in the budget because Medicare, wow. Medicaid, Social Security, wow. and the interest payments on our yeah. national debt will yeah. leave us with eight cents to run the rest wow. of the entire government. That's because of those, that, that's very, yeah. that's federal uh -huh. spending at its core. Yeah. Because we have now determined that it is a social right to have those issues okay. taken care of, medical care and Medicaid. But still we have, uh, as a nation, not embraced or even made a yeah. position about that. And, and it's interesting, it's interesting you say that because that's a real bipartisan commitment. Exactly. You know, it's funny because you watch the political pundits and you would think that the Democrats and Republicans are, you know, diametrically opposed on an issue like this. But the growth of federal spending has happened consistently under Democratic administrations, yeah. under Republican Absolutely. administrations, and programs like Social Security are protected equally by both. Well, yes and no. I just, I don't take sure. your, your but thunder, but for example, and I talk about this uh, in class mm -hmm. in terms of fairness and equity, the state of Arizona decided through its public aid program that it would not fund new organ transplants for anyone over the age of 18. Mm. My students were just shocked at this because mm. you do have state rights. Yeah. So they said, well, we don't want to spend the money on that because we think it's too expensive. So if you're under 18, you get it. If you're 18 in one day, you don't get a new kidney, you gotcha. don't get a transplant. And I can tell you from personal experience, staying in the hospital for a long time is quite expensive. Sure. My brain surgery stay cost almost $140,000, mm -hmm. which is just a big issue there. Yeah. But the state rights are, are, yeah, are very, determining, on, influencing very, yeah, very important, important parts of our life. I'd like to come to you in a second, Pamela, but I want to say, uh, as we think about this issue, the immediate thing that popped into my head um, is the supremacy clause. Uh, and also the necessary and proper clause within the Constitution, which gives ultimately, this is why this federalism question is very confusing. I tell my students that we, it, our lives would be much easier if we lived in a dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> because you would know basically who's running what, and, you know, that sort of thing. Or if we lived in a, in a confederal system in which the states have full authority, but a federal system is very complicated. It's one of the reasons why Hurricane Katrina was so difficult to, you know, to fix, mm -hmm. if you will. We can talk about that later. But in that situation, I would imagine that the Constitution would give the federal government some level of ability to step in when the, um, when the rights, if you will, uh, the health rights of the citizens are uh, infringed upon. But Pamela, what do you think? I'm, I'm in agreement with that. <laughs> I, I think every issue probably should look, be looked at individually mm -hmm. because I like that 
I have a driver's license in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. but if I go to another state, my driver's license is still recognized. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that across the board of the 50 states, then I can legally drive everywhere. But I don't know if that same license should be applied to every issue. Mm -hmm. For example, with um, gun control, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things that, that we we're going to talk about today, mm -hmm. but in uh, some states, such as Utah, mm -hmm. they, they can carry a gun openly. Well, in Utah, they're hunting mm -hmm. and fishing and doing things sure. with a gun that I wouldn't want to see anyone in my community mm -hmm. openly walking around with a gun right. because I'm not sure yeah. if it's just for hunting. And Pamela, you're referring to the uh, National Right to Carry Reciprocity Act, which was Correct. just passed in the, in, in the House of Representatives, which basically would apply the full faith and credit clause to the issue of gun control. So if you have basically uh, a gun and you have the right to carry a weapon in Indiana, if you cross the border to Illinois, Illinois would have to respect that right. Now that passed in the House uh, and very few, if I think it was only one Republican that, that stood against that, which is interesting because in many ways the Republicans argue for um, sort of state authority uh, except for, for issues like this. Mm -hmm. But um, many people believe this will not even get a vote in the Senate. And so it may be symbolic at best, but it does speak to this issue like you're talking about. What's going to happen if we allow for that kind of, um, you know, that kind of federalism to occur uh, with states. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, I agree with Pamela, there has to be a, a common sense approach or aspect to all these decisions as we make them. Um, so when we talk about gun laws, uh, we talk about the legalization of drugs, um, it, we have to, I, I think the federal government has to, have, has to create a vision and a minimal standard through which we look at or examine these issues. But then states should have the power and authority uh, because they're uh, um, you know, responsive to the needs of their citizenry on a day-to-day -day basis. They should be the ones to actually um, uh, uh, calibrate that policy measure, if you will. And um, I think, the, again, this whole notion of, of, of collaboration is very important. And if we look at the, 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 the evolution of the, again, the, the federal um, uh, empowerment or federal rights issue versus states' right issue, again, what you see is a sort of um, a push and pull, this sort of counterbalance mm -hmm. of power between um, uh, both, uh, between, uh, under both aus auspices. And what needs to happen is, again, too many interests, and you alluded to this earlier, too many private interests especially mm -hmm. uh, play into the fold and it starts to skew uh, the debate or uh, a commonsensical approach to meting out these authorities. I think, again, we need to make certain that, these are th that this authority is discussed in a very common sense way so that when we talk about gun laws, we make certain that they're, we, we, we identify the distinction between what's happening in Chicago and Utah. And um, you know, hopefully our okay. current uh, Congress will be able to do that. And sure. then to, to, to go add on to those comments, um, the idea then is really not almost state, it's almost urban rural in terms of the treatment of guns mm -hmm. in reality, Utah being a much sparsely, much more sparsely populated mm -hmm. state and Texas and other areas mm -hmm. where the majority of the population ha resides in the local communities outside. So the big difference between the two is though, from what I understand is the lack standards in some states and the background checks and other activities which is not true when it comes to the driver's license. That's pretty much standardized across all states, the test. And um, so in you, terms you're of suggesting if we had sort of a federal bottom line in gun control, that that kind of federalism would work? That might lead to a situation where there's a, that sense of consensual and mutual hmm, agreement to accept, to accept licensing. Mm -hmm for automobiles, whereas the, the different records of how well states are at screening individuals for their okay. carry concealed yeah, weapons leads to a porous system that could have someone yeah. go to a different state, pick it up, and then Absolutely. all of a sudden going into a, uh, their home state and leading to all sorts of very bad outcomes. There are no metal detectors on the borders. Right, and, and now, <laughs> as Rashid said, uh -huh. you can have these very uh, perverse outcomes mm -hmm. due to lobbying. The biggest example that comes to mind recently is how pizza was named as the vegetable right. by the Republicans to push through because of the lobbying efforts of the industry. Mm -hmm. So you really do have to look at the incentives there. And of course the NRA is really big at defeating politicians whom it doesn't like. Yeah. So that may be uh, playing a big Absolutely. role at the House of Representatives because they have to get elected every two years, yeah. whereas the Senate is a bit more insulated with their Absolutely. every six years. So, Pamela, did you want to uh, offer something on that? Well, not only that, but we talked about a little bit about gun control, but then um, Rashid alluded to the thing about 
legalizing drugs. And so in some states, marijuana, mm -hmm. um, medical mar marijuana mm -hmm. has been uh, legalized. And there's, there's talk about, well, what if we do legalize uh, some, some, some medicinal mm -hmm. type drugs across the board? And they were saying that, well, maybe that will alle alleviate some of the crime, mm -hmm. such as when alcohol became regulated, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the prohibition era. And with, with prohibition, we know that they were running the alcohol and, and making it in, in their basements mm -hmm. and things like that. And so if you look at the history of that, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Um. <laughs> well, we just did a show on legalization of marijuana, and uh, so right? I'm not okay. going to jump into that conversation. Okay. Yeah. Though I have to say, <laughs> having, having, <laughs> having had that brain, brain tumor scare and worrying uh -huh. about cancer, I really did consider whether I would move to a state that mm -hmm. would that have that so it. I can mm -hmm. survive my chemotherapy yeah. and treatment. I mean, yeah. I, I was sitting there considering, do I want to go through that entire mm -hmm. process? and not be able to eat and everything except for all those other consequences. So sure. I, I'm very interested in that sure. outcome. And, and, if, uh, and if you examine, you know, the, the general sentiment amongst uh, the citizenry of our nation, you know, there is um, sort of a movement towards, you know, uh, states' rights and that kind of crosses party lines, mm -hmm. right? Because the thought is, uh, thinking about the war on drugs, we, it's been pretty much identified that the war on drugs has been a failure, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so what, what is the populace saying? Well, we should you have states, we should embolden states to make proper decisions See, about, I, don't, you know, see I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with that. And I think that it depends on the circle that, that, that you're dealing with. Because I look at that and I say, yeah, in principle, on an issue like say marijuana, people are saying that. But when it comes to the fact that the federal government is still the largest employer in the United States, right. I don't see people really trying to move the federal government sort of to uh, lessen its power. I, I see honestly. Um, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, if you look at uh, No Child Left Behind as a perfect example. While the states are not happy about the regulations, there was a national movement to say, hey, we need some federal standards on education. We need to collectively come together. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I agree or disagree. I just don't know if that is, is the trend, if well, you will, well, culturally. Well, I know that one of the big things that's been going on uh, recently has been that the, the state of Texas and its uh, board is able basically to influence the textbooks for the rest of the United yeah. States because of their large quantity of textbooks yeah. that they buy. So I would like to have some standards that way so that one state is not determining the entire set of textbooks for the rest of the country. I mean, these people were going in and generally rewriting history books and eliminating whole chapters mm -hmm. that they didn't agree upon. Sure some based on religion and some based on personal preferences mm -hmm. or reinterpreting the, the causes and root problems of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, to mention another fact where state rights and, and, and federal rights, the Jim Crow laws that prevented African Americans from voting yeah. were all based on the idea that states had rights. Yeah. And we're taking away that clause of the amendment says life, liberty, and pursuit of property. So. Uh, right now, we're seeing Jim Crow laws in a very distinct way that you have African Americans in the in the in the uh, prison system in large numbers, and now if they come out with a felony, in some states they suffer a civil death penalty. They can't vote. They can't get food stamps. And in other states, that's not true. Yeah. And you see the states where those rights are taken away and, yeah, are, are again those Jim Crow right. states. But but there, you know, and I. I so so this is really. I mean, this is a conversation. So so I, I love to throw out you know, even the opposite side on this because, and, and as I said before, I'm not necessarily married to any ideology on this. I think the ideology of libertarianism on this issue I think is just irresponsible. Um, and I also think the, the ideology of uh, being married to sort of a unitary system is very irresponsible as well. So when you talk about the Texas example, the question really becomes how much uh, leeway should states have for determining the curriculum that's taught to their children? And on some level, I would imagine that there should be some influence that the local states, the localities would have, that the way that you ed educate a kid on the south side of Chicago may be different than the way you educate a kid in Des Moines, Iowa, based on cultural issues, that sort of thing. So I guess we've got we've to figure this out and, and, and have, I think, what you and you said uh, was really real, that we have to have these base bottom line things. Correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these uh, commitments. Well, here's what I want to do. I actually want to throw this out to you. I, I thought this would be kind of fun for us, okay? So let's do a little uh, round robin, if you will. I want to throw out a couple issues, okay? As we've talked, we've talked about a few issues. 
And I want you to answer very quickly whether you think there should be federal issues or states issues, mm -hmm. okay? It's going to be kind of interesting on this topic. So, right, health care. Pat Sajak. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> yeah. So, health care, what, what do you guys think? Federal or state issue primarily? I would say federal. Federal? Okay. Federal. Federal. Federal, they're the only one to be able to absorb all the costs. All right. Mm. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. The state um, of Illinois, we're in so much debt right yeah. now. Okay. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's insurance. Okay. And the only way to get it is to get the pool as big, so the people okay. that aren't damaged sure. are able to go you, ahead and take the people know that are. This, uh, President Obama's uh, health care act is, uh, uh, you know, being uh, reviewed by the Supreme Court now, uh, based on whether it's constitutional or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you guys think that'll go or not? Do you, I mean. As I argued before, it still comes down, is health care a human right? Sure. And other countries have all voted yes. We said no. Basically, even, it's out of pocket. Canada, even Canada says yeah. yes to health care. Sure, sure, so. sure, sure. Yeah, so I think it's, it's just a matter of time, but I think we're slowly but surely going to move to that same uh, perspective okay. as a nation. Okay, uh, med Medical marijuana, I think you guys have given us the, uh, your thoughts <laughs> on that one already. So I'm assuming you're saying a state's issue? You're saying a state's issue? State. Mm -hmm. Are you saying it? Yeah, I would, I would say a state issue. Um, but again, there, ha there needs to be a national dialogue, a very earnest dialogue okay. about what the impact of that sort of policy change might okay. be. Gun yeah. control. State issue. State issue. Mm. I'm torn because <laughs> yeah. it was gun control. Yeah. Again, I'm in agreement um, re re what, what this gentleman was sh sharing about if they have the same regulations as a driver's license, mm -hmm. the same standard set the, uh, okay. that they check the background of the person and if they have the same stringent rules then federal okay. but from state to state you know the people in utah again and texas okay. are, are free to to carry their guns throw okay. them in the back of a pickup truck and because it's sparsely okay. populated so. well, you know i just had a, a really good debate uh, with a good friend of mine um, and actually a, a common friend of ours um uh, his father was killed recently um, mm -hmm. with a home invasion and mm -hmm. uh, two mm -hmm. young men came mm -hmm. to the home and he protected himself he had a, a gun and um you know he lost his life and um that sparked a debate about this whole gun rights issue because my buddy wanted to get a gun um and what occurred to me and within the context of that debate is it's very interesting that as a mostly Christian nation and God-fearing nation mm -hmm. um, that we um, we veer away from you know um, this whole nonviolent perspective you know mm -hmm. because of the fear yeah, um, th like that we're situated with and so sure. from that perspective because I do believe in, in the tenets of nonviolence and what Dr. King um, professed through the of course the perspectives of someone like uh, Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and Gandhi um, that we should um, yeah. steer towards a nonviolent approach and okay. probably have a federal mandate to eliminate guns. Okay. Again, that's just the New Testament. Issue for you. Federal. Okay. The Old Testament says an eye for an okay. eye, so then you carry your gun. <laughs> <laughs> that's another show. That's another show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't want to get that because that, you know, we run out of time, boy. We can go that one for a long time. All right, same-sex marriage. Federal, state. 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 Federal. Federal. Hmm. Federal. I'm thinking federal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I'm thinking federal. Okay, cool. Yeah. So. Well, well, I'm thinking federal because the United States was founded on, on biblical principles, okay. on Christianity. And I think federal would carry that, uh, what the family is. Okay, cool. So. Um, I, I think, you know, it's interesting because uh, I have to tell you guys that um, I think you guys have actually made me less agnostic after listening <laughs> to your positions. <laughs> and here's why. I'm looking for consistency in ideology on this thing. And what I, as I'm sitting listening, I'm saying, hmm, why this, not this? Why this, not this? And I think where I'm going to go, based on this conversation, I think I'm going to lean towards the federal on this issue, on being a federalist, if you will. Uh, I'm going to lean towards most of these decisions being uh, decided at the federal level, uh, given the ones that you talked about. We just talked about same-sex marriage, um, um, gun control, mar marijuana legalization, et cetera. Even education is a huge issue on that. I'm going to lean towards federal federalism on this. You know, it's interesting because uh, the federalist and anti-federalist debate was one in which, you know, the, the uh, government really, the people were deciding whether we were going to have a strong central government or not. And one of the major concerns of um, the founding fathers at the time was that people would, if the issues were too national, that the localities, people would not be engaged in the political process. They said the right. issues are, are too national. but. I really believe today these issues, most of the issues we deal with, uh, you know, are, are dealt with at the, at the, at the national level. 
uh, in many ways, and I, I think I'm going to lean towards that. And yeah. I'm going to uh -huh. just say something real, real quick. My opinion is that they really set it up because they wanted the system of checks and balances, and so that is the best way to do it. And now my my answer for uh, on the on the same sex marriage states is because I feel that once enough states adopt it, then it would just go through and become consensual. Mm -hmm. To force it down the throats of the states, yeah. it'd be very difficult. Sure. Yeah. And so it'd be the same as this gun control, forcing it down people who in very populated northeastern states have no real desire. There are not many people that use or need a gun. If you have a small state like Connecticut that's 100 miles wide and 60 miles long, or rather the other way around. So uh, you know, in that respect, I think it's just the idea to allow the states to be an experimental playground where different ideas percolate okay. and then allow that to then pass throughout the country. Sure. I and think that, I have a good example. Okay. Um, and we're going to need to wrap up, so let's okay. make this uh, I, Just be really quick. Sure. But say mm -hmm. a, a, a child returns home from college and they, they live at home mm -hmm. until they get their full-time position with their job while they're looking. So they live at home with mom and dad. It's mo mom and dad's home. They have a room. Uh, so that house is the federal government. But Junior has his room, mm -hmm. and he's free to decorate his room any way he likes. But there are certain things that Junior cannot do in his room mm -hmm. while he's in mom sure. and dad's house. Okay. And so that's how that's I perceive Good. the federal government, okay. that we, the states live within the federal government. They have the freedom to do some things within the borders of their state. Mm -hmm. But the federal government has the ultimate say on okay. what they can do in that state. Professor Carter. Yeah, I, I, Pamela has a very um, graceful way of always um, kind of end the discussion. She's an educator. You know? She is an educator <laughs> at, at par excellence. And I, uh -huh. But I absolutely think that um, what Antonio and Pamela are, are saying is uh, absolutely correct. Federal standards need to be set, but states need to be given the room to be able to uh, modify or tailor those standards to meet the needs of the local populace. Sure. And I just think that, that makes sense. You know, that, the, the, the old saying says that all politics is local, but I heard it rephrased uh, recently. I've heard someone say that all local politics is national or all local <laughs> politics is global. <laughs> and I think that's the reality of what we're dealing with now. I think that, especially coming through the civil rights era, mm -hmm. I think we have, uh, not only the civil rights era, but also the Great Depression, mm -hmm. I think we have seen very clearly that we cannot leave uh, very serious issues completely to, uh, to the states. And that the federal government has a role. This is why, you know, as socially conservative as I may be on, on many things, I still believe the federal government has a very large role to play because when you look at the crisis that happened in the 1930s, the crisis that happened in the 1960s, and the crisis that happened three years ago, mm -hmm. right, economically, mm -hmm. the federal government has a role to play in our lives, and um, I don't think that's ever going to change fully. We've got to be careful with it, but I think that we have to have those standards. So. Because we have to remember we are the United yeah. States of we America. Are. We are. Right I think there. Abraham Lincoln said it best for a score and 20 years ago that it was time to heal the nation cool. and to mend it and Wonderful. not to have this separatist, but to be united. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. This Thank has been you. a very good conversation. Thank you, Ted. In America, we retain two identities, as citizens of a single nation and as citizens of the states in which we reside. The second of those identities can often determine whether we can carry a gun, who we can marry, and a host of other issues. So while national elections get all the press, I urge you to pay attention to what happens on a state level. As they say, our politics is local. For the professors, I'm Ted Williams. Thanks for watching.